Okay, shall we start again? No, all, all these words about the importance of institutions, then institutions are not exogenous, they are determined in political equilibrium. Now, uh, so the plan for today is to discuss uh, how we model institutional change, how we uh, discuss, uh, how we do political analysis of what changes the institutions. I'll start with the model of how did, uh, why did the West extend the suffrage, the paper by Lizari and Persica. Then we will gradually move to the paper about the theory of political transitions by Asimov and Robinson and then kind of a more complicated considerations. But basically, basically, all of those models are going to be about the following, uh, the following simple thing. So how we think about, about politics, the most simplest case, that we have a, do I, do I do something wrong, <laughs> using a permanent marker? We have a one-dimensional policy space. We have uh, different individuals. Each individual has preferences like this. So this is a policy space. Each point corresponds to a policy. This is an ideal point of an individual. This is the utility this individual derives. So if we have many individuals, each of them has an ideal point. And this whole thing, this is the polity. So we have a lot of individuals here. Now, um, everybody knows, or everybody is supposed to know, what happens when the majority votes over the policy proposals. So basically we know that if we just consider alternatives, then the ideal point of the median voter is going to be the Condorcet winner. It defeats any other alternative. If we have two parties competing in this one-dimensional policy space, then uh, they would always converge to this, to this ideal point of the median voter. But this, this, would not be, uh, this would not be what I need. Because this would be keeping institutions fixed, a political institution fix, f fixed. What happens to economic policy? But now, consider the following situation. We first, someone first decides who is going to vote. So, for example, if we start, I don't know, with the tiny elite, like King of England, only those voters matter. And then they could decide on two things. They could decide what policy to prefer, and then they obviously prefer the median, uh, the median uh, ideal point, the ideal point of the median enfranchised voter. But they also could make a decision whether to extend the franchise. So just to uh, allow these people to vote. This obviously, this obviously makes two changes. First, it changes the ideal point of the median voter because the median voter is now the new median voter. But it also changes the preferences of the median voter over the extension of the franchise. So it's actually possible, and we will discuss this at the end of our hour, that those people would prefer to, prefer to extend the franchise. But if those people who, whom they would enfranchise would prefer to extend fran the franchise the further, these people would not be willing to extend the franchise even to uh, this uh, set of voters. Then, then suppose, suppose that we um, have a full universal franchise. Everybody votes. Then, as I said, the policy that is going to be chosen is the ideal point of the median voter. But now we could ask ourselves, if we are interested in institutional foundations of political decisions, so if we would ask the same policy, the same people, about who should vote, is it, is it, obvious, is it obvious that they are going to keep all the voters enfranchised? And actually it's not, because in this picture, in this picture, it, it seems like everybody is, um, is spread universally across the political spectrum. But if we have only uh, two kinds of people, we have a lot of, a lot of poor people, and we have a couple of rich people, right? So all of the rich people are here, all of the poor people are here, then uh, the median voter is obviously here. So they actually might not care at all about having these people enfranchised. 
So they might vote actually to keep these people out of power forever. And this happens and it's called totalitarian, totalitarian repression. So now with this picture in mind, I could proceed with my, with my plan to discuss different models of this kind of enfranchisement. But as I said, this is about the basic decisions that are made. There is a franchise, there is this set of people who decide on economic policy, but also we are interested in dynamics of how the same set of people determines the set of people who decides on economic policy. Right? Good. So, and this is probably the most natural and the most advanced way to model institutional chase, uh, change. It might be, as I said, it might be democratization, it might be, it might be repression, there are historical examples when the majority would vote to strip some parts of the, of the minority of voting rights or voting rights in a, larger, um, in a larger sense. So it might be democratization or disenfranchisement. And um, so we will start with these two models, then we will talk about dynamic considerations about what makes uh, institutions stable and then if we have time we will talk about institutions and social mobility. So, when we model institutions, we need to think about the following, uh, the following couple. We need to think about an economic game which maps the current institutions to strategies that people could make under these institutions and in turn the payoffs that they receive. And also there should be a metagame, a set of rules that define how uh, people uh, change institution. So now we will think about this in the following way, which is like the most general way to think about this. There is the currently powerful and they decide uh, whether they like some alternative institution, for example, extended franchise or a restricted franchise, or just they want to delegate uh, the decision making to dictator. Uh, they uh, consider whether they like this better. But they also know that if they delegate political power to a dictator today, then next day it's the dictator who's going to decide whom to allocate the uh, political power. So basically, uh, we recognize that with political power, with re real de facto political power, the thing is that if you decided to give it up, then you might not have uh, power to, to get it to get it back. So, we'll start with the example that was studied by Lizarie Persico in their paper. They have uh, a lot of background material on the extension of the franchise in the, uh, Br British, uh, in, in the Br British Empire in the 19th century. I'll just tell you the model d details. Um, you, I will rush, so you might not follow uh, follow all the formulas, but I hope you will follow the logic. So if you do not, Tanya, if you do not follow the logic, you might uh, ask, uh, ask me and I will uh, repeat. Uh, I will rush through the argument again, right? So there are n groups of citizens and they will have different voting rights and each citizen has an endowment and there are two policy instruments. There is a redistribution, which is just a non-distortionary redistribution, just for simplicity, there is no uh, distortion. And it's uh, not very efficient, it's just redistribution, but it can be targeted. So you could take it away from any citizen and give it to any, any citizen that you want. And um, uh, there is another policy instrument, which is public good provision. It's more efficient, so you produce more of a public good uh, from uh, the amount of taxes that you collected. But people cannot be discriminated uh, against in this. So you could do targeted redistribution, but you cannot do targeted public good provision. And there are two parties, and they announce platforms to compete for voters. But this is not a democracy. Not every group can vote, only some groups can. So of, of those groups, there are some groups that are marked that they can vote and they will not only decide on economic policy, so how much to um, allocate to the public good provision, but they also will decide uh, whether they, they want to enfranchise other groups uh, or not. So the 
taxes are collected, they're invested. The utility depends uh, both on consumption and of consumption of private good, which is a targeted distribution, and public good. So the policy platform is just the amount I spend on the participants on the public good and the names of those of those groups that are targeted. So basically, you could think about this as follows. We collect everything that everyone owns and then redistribute it to those whom we like. Plus, we spend some of the money that we collected on the public good, public good provision. So then, each citizen cares about ideology and the, this ideology is depend on the utility of um, the party in power. Th this is still, uh, still, still symmetric. And uh, uh, different groups have different preference, different um, reaction functions to, uh, to redistribution, meaning that groups that have a higher index, they are more ideological, meaning that uh, the more you redistribute to them, the more they uh, react to this redistribution. So, here is a small mistake, unfortunately I cannot fix it, uh, uh, fix it here. This should be R and R, here, R and R. So uh, the, the formula defines the number of votes that the party uh, L gets and all other votes go to the other party. Parties make their proposal to maximize the decision, so they want, uh, they want to, to win. So what could we uh, say about the equilibrium? One Why do you need X? Why don't you just do that? Where? It should be larger than X, why don't you just larger than zero? As I said, I'm, I'm, rushing, uh, I'm rushing through the formula. P people are exposed heterogeneous in their ideological preferences. So a person's ideological preferences are fixed part plus a small noise. So we have one share, yeah, one share of people voting for uh, uh, this party. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's person specific. So it's, it's person specific. Like it's person specific. Yeah. Okay. No, you should not. I, I should keep my, 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 my pace. So one of the equilibrium, uh, equilibrium conditions is that in equilibrium, obviously, those groups that are more responsive to uh, redistribution, they receive higher transfers. So those groups that are more easily swayed by, uh, by targeted spending, they receive more. So now, now, uh, the elite might want to increase the enfranchisement because if there is no, if there are very few groups that have decision power, then those groups who are relatively non-ideological, they receive too little in equilibrium, too much spent on targeted spending, too little is spent on public good provision. So, although everyone benefits from the public good provision, the uh, some of the groups which are in the elite, they would benefit from the increasing the franchise or suffrage in, in English because, this, uh, because they are too disadvantaged in an equilibrium where everything is decided by uh, targeted spending. So this is, um, this is a model where those groups that are um, most ideological, which are furthest away from the center, they receive a disproportional share of resources. So other groups, they might want to have other uh, groups enfranchised because this will make targeted spending less, um, less efficient. So more money is going to be spent by either of the winners on the uh, on the public good, so this uh, current group uh, will benefit from this. So, um, what this model gives us? It gives us uh, the, first, the first very simple ob observation that th there might be a rational, uh, totally equilibrium uh, franchise extension. So, the currently, those who are currently in power 
although if there are very few currently in power, they might want uh, to extend the franchise. The, in this model, in this model, the sole reason for this is the imperfection of political competition. We do not want to have uh, spending to be too much targeted to the groups that ensure the win in equilibrium. And Lizeri and Persico demonstrate that it was indeed the case in early 19th century that the government spent too much on uh, targeting specific communities. And, um, but there might be other reasons to extend the franchise. Now, now, uh, the driving force in Lizeri and Persica is uh, that the current, power, the current powerful group in equilibrium wants to extend the franchise. But now, suppose that there is a different situation, that there is no uh, current group that wants uh, to extend the franchise. So, why might, why might an institutional change happen when the current elite would not want uh, the franchise extended? So one reason is uh, proposed by Asimoglu and Robinson in a stream of papers is uh, that uh, there might be a difference between the jury and the facto political power, meaning that uh, there might be a constitution, there might be a formal institution that delegates all the authority to the tiny elite, but it might be that others, those who are disenfranchised, they might uh, ever come the collective action problem from time to time, have a revolution, take the power, and the, this means that in equilibrium the actions by the elite are going to be bound by the revolutionary constraint. So in, in an ideal world, here in this model, the elite would prefer to be always in power, to always make economic decisions, but they know that something might change, some circumstances or something else, and there might be revolution, so they, uh, their current decision-making is bound by, by this. So here, as I promised in this picture, there is the small rich elite, and there are, uh, there are a lot of poor people. The, there is a certain rich of, fraction of rich, but they are relatively small. They um, differ greatly in their incomes, And uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are the following um, there are the following policy uh, policy instruments. There is a linear tax, and then after the linear tax, there is a lump sum transfer. So here, the public good provision is extremely simple. We just redistribute uh, redistribute all the money that we are collected. There is no efficiency efficiency gains in public good provision. So, uh, the taxation is distortionary, so there is a cost associated, cost for the economy associated with taking taxes. And obviously, the most preferred tax uh, by the rich is zero. They, they are rich, they don't want, they are going to be um, worse off if there is a linear taxation and lump sum transfer after that. And for the poor, they are going to be uh, richer if the uh, if the tax rates are higher, but the uh, taxation is not too much distortionary, so there is a non-zero, strictly positive, most preferred tax rate by the poor. So, then individuals live forever, they maximize their lifetime utilities, and if uh, the current franchise is that only the elite makes the decision, then policy is set by the rich is if the, uh, everyone, everyone is enfranchised, then the decision is made by the median voter, and the median voter is obviously poor, because there are more poor than the rich, so uh, they, make, they make the policy choice. And if we have a non-democracy, then the poor, uh, they may mount a revolution. A revolution brings some cost to everyone, but then uh, poor are, um, who are in power. Now, suppose for simplicity, that's not as it put us in the Asimoglu and Robinson model, but suppose that 
a revolution, if attempted, uh, always succeeds. And then uh, the poor receive all the output after the revolution. Basically, that's not surprising because they make the decision after, after, the, uh, after the revolution. And um, after, uh, after the revolution happens, there is some uh, random variable. So it might, be, uh, it might be good to have a revolution, it might be bad to have a revolution, and they uh, do not know uh, they do not know uh, in advance in the current period where this will be good to have a revolution in the next period. S so, uh, the problem is that in a Markov perfect equilibrium, in an equilibrium when the past doesn't matter and we cannot condition the future strategies on what is going to happen before this uh, decision, decision is made, the problem is that uh, in equilibrium, if there is no threat of revolution, then the elite will set taxes to zero in equilibrium and there will be no revolution. But if there is, uh, if there is a revolution, if um, the revolution might happen in some circumstances, then they would uh, have a tax rate which is uh, consistent with making the poor indifferent between making a revolution and not making a revolution. Obviously, you just concede uh, as much as needed to prevent revolution. The problem is, in this model, and this is, um, and this is highly uh, technical, that in some states of the world, in some states of the world, it's not possible to transfer enough, uh, enough um, wealth to the poor. So the problem is that because we cannot commit to redistribute in subsequent period, so we cannot uh, pro promise to provide enough um, mm, enough income to poor, uh, regardless of whether the circumstances in the next period are good or bad. Because of this, we cannot actually. Um, in some circumstances, provide a transfer which would be big enough to buy the poor, poor off. So the problem is now, if the revolution is costly enough, if the uh, rich hate revolution is, um, so that they um, so that they um, need to avoid it at any cost, then if they cannot make a transfer uh, large enough to solve the revolution problem, they have to democratize. They need to extend the franchise, ceding the power to uh, set the tax rate. But this will, uh, this will uh, provide the commitment that they need, and this will um, help them to avoid, uh, avoid the revolution. So, there is a there is a big question here. One big question is that it seems it seems that this model, like in terms of discussion, assumes that when the crowd comes to the presidential palace in a uh, in a country where the rich have all the power, then the president could say, "Okay, I promise you democracy," meaning that it's the median voter who is poor is going to decide next period. This is credible, but if the same president says, um, I promise you to pay a lot of money or provide a lot of food or a lot of, uh, I don't know, our team will win next World Cup, then it is somehow next, uh, less credible. Kuhn, you, un you should not laugh. Some dictators promised and some dictators delivered on giving, on gi on giving the World Cup. Yeah, Argentina, 1978. They delivered. They, they, de they delivered. Yeah. No, no. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, in, in the last uh, in the last game in the semifinal group, Argentina had to beat Peru six to zero to get into the final, and it was amazingly it was six to zero. Seven zero. Yeah. No, no, no. I th <laughs> I think it, it was six, uh, six, uh, six to zero. So yes, yeah. 
your government was too weak. Okay. To <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, here, in the theory of political transitions, although the issue of credible promise of democracy versus a credible promise of food is the kind of unresolved, is assumed away in this model, still, uh, this, is, this was the first model uh, of institutional change, of institutional dynamics, where transitions, they occur because some of the groups, those who are in power, they are unable to commit to particular actions to the future. Once we assume that there is a different ability to commit to democracy and to particular actions with respect to taxes, then in equilibrium it happens that you could only mm, democratize when in, in some circumstances. Now, now, so, uh, this, uh, this model is rich, but not rich enough. For example, uh, this model doesn't have repression. So I promised you that the model should include a possible disenfranchisement. This model doesn't allow for, uh, for impossible, a possible disenfranchisement, but there are other models that allow for possible disenfranchisement. I mean, this looks a kind of drastic because uh, very few leaders or very few powerful groups were able to really trim the electorate. Like, I mean, if you're a dictator, I think if you're a strong leader and your personal preferences, say, are here, right? And you fear that there might be a revolution and the probability of revolution uh, depends on depends on the relationship on the difference between the media and voter position and your own position then if you could if you could somehow eliminate these people right then you have a lower revolutionary uh, re revolutionary uh, threat because the previous media and voter was here so the difference was huge now that these people are gone from the political landscape, the median vote is here, so the difference is actually smaller, so you are less threatened. I mean, very few, very few leaders in history really had the opportunity to, um, to do these things. But uh, we have good models and good narratives, for example, about uh, Stalin's ways of, Stalin's ra uh, Stalin's repressions, they affected about, uh, like, they really killed about one to one and a half percent of the population. So this is actually like this, right? But actually, if you, if you like, extend the logic, so people could not, could not be only literally killed, but also kind of scared when someone who has the same views are killed, then you actually could trim the electorate. Right, like you kill people like this, and Mao. if these people are okay, Mao. You actually the most successful guy was uh, Pol Pot in, yeah. in Cam yeah. Cambodia. <laughs> but but this is not only about dictatorships. Um, the, 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 there is yeah, Rwanda. Yeah, you could think sure. You, you could think, you could think, yeah, there are a lot of cases where this logic really helps to understand it. But what I'm saying that there are examples, even in uh, almost in perfect democracies, perfect in the sense that everyone had uh, had a right to vo vote and the votes were um, were cons cons consequential. Uh, and Schleifer and Ed Glazer in their paper on the, the Curly Effect they uh, tell the story of the Irish mayor of Boston, James Curley, who would pursue policies that would drive non-Irish, non-Irish meaning Italian uh, people from Boston, which would eventually change, uh, change the uh, electorate. So it's a kind of a electoral strategy. You have a majority. What Guzinski and here? Oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> 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 Berezovsky. 
Uh, okay, uh, Kun, this was 20 years ago. No, but you're talking about lower No, that was 20 years ago. I mean, Berezovsky owned TV for half a year, over 15 years ago. And it was inconsequential. It didn't help him. It didn't, didn't help him much. So, I'm taking stock of the first half of the lecture. Two theories of democratization, two theories of franchise extension, two different forces uh, driving the institutional change. One, preferences of those who are in power, and the second, uh, uncertainty about who is going to be powerful tomorrow or who is able to mount a revolution uh, tomorrow. But, of course, of course, other uncertainties, for example, uncertainties about payoffs, might generate institutional change, uh, change as well. Now, look at the uh, following model. That's a famous uh, model by Kevin Roberts. This is about individuals and possible clubs. So there are individuals who are numbered, and there are, uh, they're basically ordered, and there are possible clubs. You, you would have a club of one person, a club of person number one and number two, a club of a person number, number one, number two, and number three, a club of persons number one, number two, number three, and number four, and so on. And we assume that in each club, the majority decides uh, on what is going on in this club, and also about who is going to enter this club. And when you think about this, when you think that a club is a good example of a strategic situation where people makes, make decisions who is going to enter the club, then you'll see that this is basically the most simple example of the extension of the, the franchise. Think of these uh, discrete, uh, discrete groups that decide which are other groups that need to be uh, enfranchised. So, and, and, and think, think about the club. So when one person decides whom to invite to the club, then he understands two things, and these are two driving forces of institutional change here, is that once there is another person in the club, then the median voter shifts. So if we compare this club and this club here, one has all the power here, number two has all the power because he is the um, he or she is uh, uh, the median voter, right? Now, but these people, they might have different preferences over policy of what is going on in the club, and they might have different preferences of whom to uh, invite, in, invite to the club. So, um, uh, look at Uh, look at the following situation. Look at the following example. Player one, player one, might want to expand the club to the size of three. His uh, ideal preference is that the size of club is three, and he loves these two guys. But now, if player one knows that the ideal preferences of the player number two is the club of four, and the ideal preferences of the uh, guy number three is the club of five, then the problem is that the player one knows that once he allows the second guy in the club, then they would move to the club of three, then they would move to the club of four, and they would move to the club of five. So although his preferences are to be in the club of three, he wouldn't go there, right? Because he knows that if he goes there, then he would go to the club of, club of five. So think about this as a story about the elite, or the king, the middle class, and uh, the poor. The king might prefer the middle class to be in power because the middle class will make all kinds of investments and be nice to and spend some money on king's palace and um, be kind of good. But also, but, but the middle class uh, wants the poor to be in franchise, then the king would not transfer power, would not extend the franchise to the middle class, because the king knows that once the franchise is extended, they would go to the 
to the whole enfranchisement, which is too bad for the king. So the club, uh, the club example is actually a kind of a powerful um, thinking tool about the um, about the institutional about the institutional change. Now. Okay, so three papers done. I'm uh, going to the next step. Uh, the step about, uh, okay, I, I will do it very fast. Uh, here is first the majority decides about a constitution. A constitution is just the supermajority requirement, and they then they vote over a policy. So, okay, the first question, just for the understand, uh, just to see whether you follow me or not. The Russian constitution, um, if you want to amend it, you need the agreement of two-thirds, I think, of subject of federation, two-thirds of re regions. And if you want to replace the constitution, you need to have three-fifths of the votes. So, what would be the rationale for this? It seems from the formal rules that it's easier to replace Russian constitution than to amend it. It's easier to replace than to change. So, if you want to change, you actually might pass a replacement with a small change. There will be other changes. You probably, okay, I see, you all follow me. This question doesn't require anything that you hear. It's, no, it was just an arithmetical mistake. They thought that three-fifths is more than two-thirds. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, le at least this is an, an explanation of those who wrote the Constitution nowadays. When they asked, they say, Victor Shane says that we just thought that three-fifths is more than, <laughs> more than two-thirds. Two <laughs> You meant to change the number like that. Okay, that's just a story. No, and I saw you all followed my lecture, so you didn't concentrate on the question. You were just thinking. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, that's all on the paper of Barbara, uh, Barbara and Jackson. No, uh, yeah. Can I ask one question? Uh, sure. So the whole, the whole model is about uh, wealth distribution. Just of production. No, the, the, okay. The, 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 the model, Barbarian Jackson model, is as follows. We first vote on the voting rule, then we vote on a decision which affects our life, some redistribution. There is, of course, some residual, residual uncertainty. So the question that they ask is what are kind of a self stable constitutions? What, what are the rules that survive uh, the the vote over them as the rules of making the decisions. Yes, but I'm, I'm referring to the paper one at the very start, you stop at one, and it's all about the distribution, but no one ever produces something. But it's a good no, but the elites have good reasons, and that's also in the Asimov and Robinson story. Okay, in, 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 it's, it's the production of the in my, in my example, we reach the middle class and the elite. It's exactly the question that faced a lot of kings over the over the history, they thought that if they empower middle class, then there will be more investment, there will be more growth, everything. But they wouldn't empower the middle class, because they thought that there is a slippery slope, that once they empowered them, they would extend the franchise further. I, I, I agree, but that's not the model. The model only considers wealth, not production. So that, that's how you describe that action is excluding the model. It will reinforce the results. Because they don't what do you think by not in the model? There's no production function, there's only wealth. So this is an so think, think of wealth as the outcome of an equilibrium when every, everyone made, made an investment decision and uh, then collected the fruits of their labor. And so the wealth is not the wealth but it's uh, the wealth that occurred to you because of your efforts and investment. So 
So it's like a dollar. I mean, but, but the channel you describe investment, it might be capital product. Yes, the channel you describe is that the production goes up, and that's why I don't extend this franchise because I'm afraid that I will lose power. But it can't go up because you assume the No, no, uh, okay. No, when I, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking of extending the franchise, and I have the following trade off. I could extend the franchise. This will increase uh, increase incentives to produce, but this also will uh, set uh, start a dynamics which would lead to a policy which is very far away from my preferred preferred policy. Yeah. This actually might explain why, like, uh, when you read the narrative of revolutions, like of English Revolution or the French Revolution or even the Russian Revolution, you would always uh, you would always ask yourself if the king would know or if he would anticipate what is going to happen uh, at the terminal node of the game, then wouldn't be it uh, better to concede a lot of things? Why wouldn't you grant a constitution? Why wouldn't you see the par power to the parliament? Why wouldn't you do all of these things? And this model, especially the club model and its offsprings, it kind of explains that you might not be able actually to um, do a lot of concessions, that although it seems that you are free to make all kind of concessions and you could find a balance between your interests and the interests of uh, those who would mount a revolution, but actually the choice is almost binary. You need either to concede everything or to concede, uh, concede not at all. So uh, these models, I think, are, they provide very good intuition for this kind of situation. For this kind of situation where would you think that looking backwards there should have been a good bargain which would not involve killing, uh, killing the elite. But uh, these models show that, the slippery slope argument shows that there might not be such an equilibrium. Now, uh, how much time, Masha, do you keep? 10 to 15 minutes, okay. Um, in these 10 to 15 minutes, we extend our logic further and we just uh, discuss one particular, one particular model, uh, one particular issue. Again, it's everything about this uh, extending the franchise and the institutional change. So when we have this double, double decision, we, we have a decision on policy right now and we have a decision who is going to be in power tomorrow. So now, uh, there is a common, um, like think of it, uh, why would a democracy in some country be stable? And if you look at stable democracies around the world, then most of democratic countries, almost all democratic countries in the world, they are extremely equal in terms of wealth and income distribution, right? Because most of the democratic countries around the world are in Western Europe, m most of them uh, are very equal. In a, uh, in a egalitarian country, in an equal country, there is um, uh, the model about the extension of the franchise, this model. It's also uh, explains the reason why would democracy be stable. Because everyone, uh, everyone is the same. If basically, if basically all the people have almost the same preferences, right? Everybody is here. Then why would you disenfranchise someone? It doesn't, it doesn't change the media vote a lot. So, there is one country uh, which has an extremely stable democracy for hundreds of years and at the same time is very unequal. This is the United States, right? So it's a kind of a huge counterexample to this logic. So one logic that explains generally why uh, democracy is so stable in the United States is the so-called de Tocqueville argument. Uh, and the argument is that the United States have such high social mobility that uh, this somehow mitigates the impact of inequality. So, how would you, uh, how would you introduce uh, social mobility into, uh, into this model? The main thing about the social mobility is that you might want, you might want to 
uh, change the institutions if you expect for some reason that you are going to be in the different economic strata, different economic class in the next period. So think, um, think of the following situation. I never do pictures. It's my coffee, Georgi, who does pictures. And <laughs> sometimes I'm kind of confounded by uh, the pictures. No, no, he is absolutely great. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. This argument of this uh, mobility, uh, class mobility, as com uh, computers as quintiles of, of income. Uh, it has been for a long time, and Alessina and I was also working on it. But I find the argument that in America, the inequality being a problem without taking into account the absolute number of how I'm getting wealthier. First, is it about income inequality or wealth inequality, which is different? And second... Which is different, but highly correlated. Uh, not only seven, because that... I may have an endowment of my... Uh, no, what I'm saying that in theory it might be very different, but in practice it's very highly correlated. That's what Tama Piketty says. Uh, but if it's, if it's about... Mo uh, yeah, and the, the second point is, to what extent it matters, and I'm not talking data, I'm talking more in a modeling uh, or philosophical way, to what extent it matters to which class I belong and to what is my wealth, uh, wealth, uh, wealth position. Because it may be that the society in America is very, uh, is much less equal, but everybody is growing so fast that I, I may have everything that I need even though I belong to low class. So is it about the expectations of belonging to an upper class or an expectation of being wealthier? Okay, I, I, I actually, I actually, I actually the way we model it. I, I'm not arg arguing with this. I just said that uh, this kind of argument, uh, the extension of the franchise argument or the size of the franchise argument, uh, would not work about the United States, about any unequal country. In an, in, a, in an unequal country, this would not be an explanation why institutions are stable. So basically, the whole story about this. Uh, about these pictures is that um, suppose that there is social mobility and I am a median voter today but if I expect that I'm going to be uh, that I'm going to be rich next period then I would, might want to disenfranchise the poor today because I expect to be rich in the next period I yes. would want power to be to be with yeah, the with the rich the so yeah. And basically, basically, the, in, in this paper, most of the formal arguments, they're going to be about the following, that the social mobility, it helps, uh, makes democracy stable if it affects the whole society uniformly, right? And if it affects, for example, only the upper classes of the society, so just, for example, the uh, social mobility between the upper middle class and the rich, then it actually might be might have an undemocratic effect. Then there are incentives. Uh, that are like then stronger social mobility might lead to the desire to disenfranchise to disenfranchise the poor. Do you see this argument? Yes, so, uh, so the uh, okay. So it's not a. In, in essence, it, it works when the upper class goes to the uh, lower class. That that always works because you have a perpetual mobility going up, and every and you never disenfranchise the poor. Yeah. And you not do not disenfranchise the rich because they are going to fall anyway down. Here you disenfranchise you disenfranchise the rich. No, but no, but if you have such a if you have a melting pot which affects only a part of the society, then as we just discussed, then you have incentives to disenfranchise these two guys. Because now if you're a current decision maker and the melting pot is here, then you expect that the next period you're going to be here, your interests are going to be here, which means that you better 
of disenfranchising these guys and moving the uh, decision-making power to uh, the right of uh, the right of yours. So actually, this produces a kind of an interesting uh, an interesting result. So think of three groups of the society: the poor, the middle class, and the and the rich. Now suppose that we ask them uh, about their preferred level of um, social mobility between the middle class and the rich. There are things that actually affect the social mobility in a society kind of non-universally. For example, secondary education basically affects the social mobility between poor and the middle class. The higher education affects social mobility between the middle class and the rich. So now, suppose that this society is asked, is asked about their preferred quality of spending about higher education, so the social mobility between the middle class and the rich. Then what happens? The rich are of course opposed to this. The rich has nothing to gain from the uh, mobility between the rich and the middle class. Because the higher is the mobility, the higher is their chances to end up in the middle class instead of the rich. The middle class is obviously uh, want as much mobility between the middle class and the rich as possible, right? Because they, then they have chance to join the rich, higher chance to join the rich. Now, what the poor thinks about the social mobility between the middle class and the rich? Yeah, okay, first I need something naive. You are too smart to be the first responder. The naive intuition that the poor doesn't care about the social mobility that doesn't affect them, right? But a more sophisticated answer, like by Kuhn, they actually hate this social mobility because if there is a high social mobility, then the political power might be transferred from the middle class to the rich, so the decision making will be further away from the poor. So, like, poor join the coalition with the rich against the middle class over, uh, over the social mobility. Uh, okay, and probably I better stop here. But if you have questions about institutional change, I, I have a couple of papers more to talk about, a couple of models, and I, and I just started social mobility actually. So this is like a new paper with uh, Darwin? It's yeah. not that new. But then, <laughs> this is something that could be like studied from historical data, you know, in terms of who are rich because in, in, in the US it's like uh, uh, yeah, a, a good test of this yeah. model would be would be would need an exogenous shock to mobility. So we, we Which you probably have. I think there might be uh, there might be some exogenous shocks to mobility. For example, uh, an ascendant of a especially Catholic king in France have produced a lot of Huguenots uh, moving to the United States. So there are sometimes there are shocks to uh, social mobility and there are sh uh, shocks to demographic um, allocations, but. Okay, if we, if we would have had a good, a good example or a good story, this would be better. But we don't. Vinci. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, you go first. Well, uh, it's after nine, so if you can comment uh, on the, uh, the American politics have been uh, described as disenfranchised. The pure have been disenfranchised for a long time, so that's the upcoming of uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, why they, they got so much support. So what's your view on, on that opinion? I'm, as every single uh, good analyst, I'm totally dumbfounded about this. I, I, I've been extremely interested in American politics for as long as I remember myself. I remember watching Carter versus Reagan in 1980, and I'm, as I said, I, I'm completely dumbfounded. That's. I, my theory of Trump is uh, totally no, no, unrelated. No, no. I think no, no. the effect on Sanders is, is equal. I mean, no, I, 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 I do not. I do not. I do not see any wonders uh, about Son Sanders. I do not think that he is. Uh, he is very different from other candidates. There were leftist candid candidates. 
I mean, uh, think of uh, George McGovern uh, versus Edmund Muskie in uh, 1972. McGovern won over Muskie, but if Muskie won over McGovern in Democratic primary, this would be like Hillary Clinton winning over Bernie Sanders. So that, that's, that's not a wonder. And Trump is a total wonder. I actually I think about him as a... <laughs> no, 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 no. I think about him as a like North Weingast Wallace theory of that. I think Republican Party, the former Republican Party, was an a very how to say um, a very smart, a very uh, intellectually sophisticated construction, and now it totally fell apart. And now, now we will. We see a great challenge, and then we'll see what happens. But, no, but this is not about this is not about this presentation. That's no, I don't, I don't, I don't like this. I, I don't like my answer to your question. I should have answered in terms of in terms of this. <laughs> So okay, no, okay, okay, I could, I could answer in terms of this. So in terms of modeling my question, could you be rephrased? Uh, is there some sort mm -hmm. of uh, voting group that is more engaged than previous? And that's why we see these dynamics of more polarized primaries. Okay, no, okay. Uh, right wing and left wing. Okay. Um, I don't know, those who study American politics know that uh, it might seem that you could pin down the American politics into two-dimensional uh, two dimensional policy space. One is a kind of economically economic dimension, and here is the social dimension. So here comes uh, economic, um, America, American liberalism, meaning high taxes, a lot of garbage paid, social security, things like this. Here low taxes, a lot of private initiatives, things like this. Here you have uh, all kind of, I don't know, gay bashing, um, white supremacy, here you have uh, uh, the, the, op the extreme opposite, the extreme opposite of this. So one might think that uh, the American politics is um, two-dimensional because everything pins very well into this picture. But if you actually try to do some numerical uh, exercises about this, then it's a well-known proposition that actually there are no two dimensions, that they collapse something like along this uh, along this line so you have republicans here and you have uh, uh, have democrats here so it's actually makes sense to talk about um, this kind of dimensionality in in american uh, in, in american politics so I, I think that the efforts of the republican party and the all the campaign finance laws which which i actually I'm libertarian, so I support uh, freedom of speech in terms of freedom of spending money. But I think they were extremely successful to um, to shifting this line toward the social dimension line and have all the cultural wars uh, working in their direction. And now this thing somehow collapses, this construction. So it goes to this direction, and now we have two candidates which basically move to the median voter position on trade, on basically everything. On, on economic terms? Yeah, on economic terms, yeah. And, and, and this dimension kind of collapses. You could think about this as a win of this, or... I mean, the, like, the gay rights thing, it was a important issue 20 years ago, it's a non-issue, it's almost non-issue electorally right now. Well, so the, the thing is, it, it, it not, it, it's not collapses, it's still one-dimensional, but it moves toward the economic yeah. line. So the Trump is just a strangely thing, a median, median, 
he's close to the median on social dimension, which becomes an irrelevant. So he's forced to, the party is forced to move to the median voter on the economic dimension. Whew. Okay. <laughs> the prestige of science saved. <laughs> in, in, in my view. <laughs> science part over there. So you have people 30 years ago on the top and people 30 years after in the bottom, right? But somehow the support of their positions is the same. I would assume that uh, Richard Branson has more consumption opportunities than Howard Hughes did. So the right tail definitely goes to the right. So there is an opportunity for the right guy to go up. So that kind of raise your argument about, you know, the best guys not wanting it. You, 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 basi you basically say that for policy, for, policy, for policy matters, it's important what is your absolute position rather than what is your relative position. I'm saying that I, I'm, I, support is not... Yeah, support. okay. I, I, I'm not sure that this, this is an argument that is easy to make. If, for example, you um, you think about allocating money between be between more to spend more on secondary education or more on higher education, then I do not see why it is the absolute position uh, is more important than the relative position. I'm not saying it breaks down everything immediately, but your argument works because of the balance. I don't know. You might be right. Uh, other questions? Great, many thanks for having me here.